Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to get a chance to talk to you all and give you all an update about OSHA's update for dairy farm operations today. Uh, there again, I hopefully I can give you all some news you can use today about what we've done on dairy farms under this local emphasis program since we started inspecting dairy farms under the local emphasis programs since July of 2014. So what I hope to share with you all today is what we've done as far as inspections that we've conducted on the farms and violations that we found. And with my objectives here, I will cover that. I want to cover just to back up a little bit, a little review with you all. I want to make sure I, you all understand our ocean inspection priorities. We don't just drive, drive down the road and we don't like ABC Farm and we're going to inspect you today. There's a reason why we're inspecting that farm. And I'm going to discuss with you today is how we get to the, the dairy farms under this local emphasis program. Again, I'm going to talk to you about the top 10 OSHA standards that were cited on these dairy farms, and then we'll take questions and answers at the end. So with that, let's just talk about our inspection priorities. There again, first thing we talk about is an imminent danger. Now, what am I talking about imminent danger? That would be a situation where if you were doing, say, work on the top of your barn and you had some of your employees up there and they're up there with no fall protection, and then the local area office, OSHA office, received numerous calls about employees up on a barn, you know, 20, 30, 40 feet off the ground with no fall protection, we would consider that to be imminent danger. And we'd probably be going out there and take a look at that operation. And then I'm going to talk about fatalities, catastrophes, non-formal, non-fatal accidents, complaints, referrals, and then I'm going to talk specifically about the dairy farm local emphasis program. So number one thing I want to tell you is exceptions, enforcement exceptions and limitations under the Appropriation Act. So for any activity, even over and above a local emphasis program, if we're coming to your farm because we got imminent danger, we're coming to your farm because we received a employee complaint, we're coming to your farm we cannot do an inspection. Even if you had a fatality at your farm, we are exempt. A farming operation is exempt from all OSHA activities if it employs 10 or fewer employees currently and at, at all times during the last 12 months. So if we come out to your establishment, if we come out to your farm, had an opening conference, the first question we're gonna ask is what is the maximum employees you've had employed at your farm at any one time in the last 12 months. And if you tell us you've only had six employees, that inspection is going to end right there. And we're not going to continue that inspection. Again, even if you had a fatality, we have to show that you had 11 or more employees at any one time in the last 12 months. And again, when we counting employees, we're not counting family members. And be aware, a part-time employee is also counted as one employee. And also be aware, and I pass right by that, if, if you had an active temporary labor camp during the preceding 12 months, you would not be exempt, okay? So with that, if you had a fatality or a catastrophe, so if you had one, a fatality at your location or a catastrophe, that means if you had three or more of your employees actually admitted to the hospital. If you had a fatality or catastrophe, by law, OSHA rules and regulations, you're required to contact OSHA and report it to us within eight hours. And then next, if you had a non-fatal accident, what I mean by that, and that's second bullet on the sl third bullet on the slide, our inpatient hospitalization, you had an amputation or eye loss. So if you had one employee admitted to the hospital, we had one employee at amputation, or one employee at a loss of eye, you must report that to OSHA within 24 hours. So as far as contacting OSHA, and it states here on the slide, you're going to call us, and there again, the OSHA offices are open Monday through Friday, 8 to 4.30. If it was 2 o'clock Sunday morning, you would call us on our OSHA 24-hour hotline number, which is one 800 321-6742, or you're going to go online electronically and you're going to report that information to us. You're going to tell us who you are, what happened, give us a brief description about the incident and a contact person and phone number to get a hold of. Again, this is for all fatalities, catastrophes, 
are non-fatal accidents. You got to contact us. And as far as contacting us, this is just showing you a little map here of the New York State OSHA office area offices. So Buffalo covers counties in the western part of the state. Here in Syracuse, which I'm from, Central New York, we got 24 counties here in Central New York, and then continuing on east, Albany, and then down to the Metro New York region. And again, these offices are open Monday through Friday, 8 to 4:30. We can also receive a referral. So maybe you had a fatality at your establishment, and somebody at your location, your farm, called 911, and you had the ambulance responding, the fire department responding, or the police department. Once that police officer comes onto your scene of that accident that occurred, they're making a determination. Is this a criminal matter or is this a civil matter? Meaning a civil matter, it was just a, a farming accident. They may make a referral to us. Or if, if we happen to have one of our inspectors just driving down the road going from point A to point B, and we see some of your employees say up on top of your barn doing some roofing work without fall protection, that inspector could stop and take a look at it. Or that last bullet, the media referral, maybe it's a slow day today and maybe a newscasters are out there and reporters are looking for something to uh, put in their newspaper today and they see your people up on a roof and they stop by and say, can we take your picture? And they take your picture and here you show up the next day. Your employees up on our roof and no fall protection. We can take that as a media referral. Or we could receive a complaint. There again, we have what's called a formal and non formal complaints. So if we receive a letter, information from one of your current employees or a family member or a representative of a current employee at your establishment, we could take that as a complaint and then we come out and do an inspection at your farm within five days. As compared to a non-formal investigation, if we received a phone call or complaint from one of maybe your neighbors that doesn't like you're making a lot of dust out in the field, or maybe it was an ex-employee, we receive a call like that and we do receive many calls every day from ex-employees or disgruntled neighbors or union, non-union. We will handle those by fax and phone, meaning we would contact you, we receive, tell you we received a complaint about safety and health conditions at your farm. We don't know if they're true or false, but as, but as long as you respond back to us within five days, tell us what you did, if those items are true, what you did to correct those conditions, or why those conditions were false, as long as we receive a response to you within five working days, we would close that out, and we would not come out to your establishment to do an inspection. So now let's talk specifically, we've gone through that, and let's talk specifically about the Dairy Farm Operations Local Emphasis Program. So as far as targeting dairy farms, and there again, this Dairy Farms Operations Local Emphasis Program, this affects, when I showed you on that New York State map, it affects any farms that are in the Buffalo Area Office jurisdiction, the Syracuse Area Office jurisdiction, and the Albany Area Office jurisdiction. So most of upstate New York. And specific to the enforcement and us targeting and be able to do an inspection on your farm, what's different with this, farms that have temporary labor camps are exempt under this low consensus program. So the only questions we'll be asking if we came to do an inspection at your farm under this low consensus program, we're going to ask you if you had 10 or fewer employees currently at all times during the last 12 months. So if you tell us, oh yes, last summer we were doing haying and during the haying operation, uh, just this past summer, uh, we had 13 or 14 employees for one day, then that would put you above the, uh, the requirements. You'd be part of the low comes program and we would do an inspection. But if you tell us, no, in the last 12 months, we've only had six employees, we're not going to inspect your establishment on this low consensus program. So as far as standards relating to agriculture, so as we come to your farm, we're looking to ensure that you're in compliance with standards relating to agriculture. So specific standards we're going to take a look at. I'm going to explain these further, but on this slide here, 
We talk about 29 CFR Code of Federal Relations, 1904 for record keeping, 29 CFR 1928, which are agricultural standards. We do have some general industry standards that are referenced from the agricultural standards. And then last but not least, we have what's called the General Duty Clause of the OSHA Act, which states that all employers must provide safe and health work conditions for employees. And we're gonna reference the section 5A1. And I'll explain this, all of these further. So the first let's talk about is record keeping. So all industries and specifically to you all, we're talking about agriculture, must maintain records of occupational injury illnesses and they must maintain these records. Again, you do not have to maintain these if you are an employer who has 10 or fewer employees at all times during the last calendar year. So if you are an employer, you are a Pacifica farm and you've had 11 or more employees at any one time in the last 12 months, you must maintain injury illness records. So what I'm talking specifically is I show you a couple of photos here. So that top one, that's an OSHA 300 log. That's the log you have to maintain throughout the year. So if you had any recordable, so you had any employees who had days away from work, they had medical treatment, or they had restricted duty or job transfer because of an occupational injury illness, they must be placed on this log throughout the calendar year. And then at the end of the calendar year, come January, so for example, we just uh, went past calendar year 2018, so you'd be inputting these injury illnesses that occurred during calendar year 2018, and then come January of 2019, you add up all your totals on the bottom of the OSHA 300 log, and then you put them on a summary sheet, which is that next picture below that, that's an OSHA 300A. That's a summary of occupational injury illnesses. And you would add, put all your totals in there. And then also be aware that we also, we do site specific targeting. So if you are an employer, a farm that's had 20 or more employees at any one time in the last, during the last previous calendar year, you must have to enter your OSHA 300A log, which is your summary of work-related injury illnesses. You must enter this information electronically on the OSHA website. So be aware of that. So if you are a larger farm, you should be aware that you needed to input that information electronically. And that should have been entered for calendar year 2018. That should have been completed by March 2nd, 2019. So we've already passed that date. So be aware of that. Next, general industries when referenced in 1928-21A. So these are agricultural standards, which actually reference general industry standards. So a biggie there would be in the middle of the page, 1928-21A5, the hazard communication standards. So be aware of that. And we'll talk more of that further. I just wanna make you aware of each standards that are applicable to agriculture. And again, like it states at the bottom there, the rest of the 1910 standards does not apply to agricultural operations. Next, agricultural standards, which are 1928. So we have 1928-51, which is the roller protection structures, our ROPs for tractors used in agricultural operations. And then 1928-57, which is our guarding of our field, farm field equipment, like the tractors and implements that hook up to the tractors and then our farmstead equipment, which is our stationary equipment throughout the farm and in the, the barn, which are stationary, and then cotton gins. The 1928.110 standards, these are field sanitation standards, and these are enforced by, our, as OSHA, we are on the U.S. Department of Labor, also referring here, which is wage in our division, which is also under U.S. Department of Labor, they enforce the temporary labor camp standards. So OSHA does not inspect temporary labor camps. And then last but not least is the general duty clause. So if we do not have a specific agricultural standard, we're gonna reference the general duty clause, which states each employer shall furnish each of his employees employment and place of employment, which are free from recognized hazards 
that are causing or are likely to cause death or serious physical harm to his or her employees. There again, this applies when there's no specific standard. So like the photograph there on the right, if you're utilizing a skid steer, we do not have a specific agricultural standard for skid steers. But if you're utilizing one of these pieces of equipment, we're gonna cite the general duty clause and then if we have something wrong with this skid steer, we're gonna reference a consensus standard or the manufacturer's operating manual for this piece of equipment. So with that, let's talk specifically about this LEP, the Dairy Farm Operations Slow Consensus Program. There again, the LEP inspections began in July of 2014. So from two, July of 2014 until March of 2019, this is the inspections that we've conducted. And this is, LEP is specific to area office jurisdictions for the Buffalo area office, the Syracuse area office, and the Albany area office. So the total number of inspections conducted by those three offices total, we conducted 40 inspections. Of those 40 inspections, eight of those inspections were for complaints or we received, received a complaint from a current employee, a family member of current employee, or a representative, the represented employees working at that farm. We had two fatalities, which we investigated. There again, be aware, there were other fatalities that occurred in the Buffalo, Syracuse, and area, Albany office jurisdiction, but those fatalities occurred at farms where they had 10 or fewer employees at that farm at any one time in the last 12 months when we conducted that inspection. So the only ones we had jurisdiction were able to do the inspection were on two farms that had fatalities where they had 11 or more employees working. We did one follow-up, which just means we, went, we did an inspection at a farm, and then we didn't receive some of the corrective actions so for items that we were, we were cited there, violations. We went back to do a follow-up inspection to see if the farm actually corrected that condition that they were cited for. We had three referrals. So referrals could be, like I stated before, we received a referral that could be from a code enforcement officer, that could be from a wage and hourly person who's there doing a temporary labor camp and maybe saw some unsafe conditions and made a referral to us, or that could have been coming from a police officer who was there there because you had called 911 because you had an accident at that farm. And also we had non-fatal accidents there again this non-fatal accidents this is where you had one of your employees that was hospitalized one of your employees that had an amputation or one of your employees that had a loss of eye or you were required to contact us and we see three of those and then actually program plan inspections so these are farms that we targeted on a local emphasis program for dairy farm operations 23 of these we targeted and we completed 23 inspections on a local census program in the Buffalo, Syracuse, and Albany or Alps jurisdiction. So of the 40 inspections conducted, we issued a total of 82 violations. And of those 82 violations, the average violation and fines, penalties for those violations was $2,283. These are the top 10 OSHA standards cited on the dairy farms. And you can see this top 10, and I'm going to show you some illustrations of these, but I just want to go over with these before you go into the specifics on those violations. Number one, by far, 75% of the citations issued by OSHA during this local emphasis for, for dairy farm operations were the OSHA 5A1 general duty clause. And I'll get into specifics of what types of violations were cited under the, under the general duty clause. Number two was 1910-1200E1. There again, this is specific to the hazard communication program, including the safety data sheets, labeling and training. Number three, 1928-57C2I, for guarding of power transmission components. Four, 1928-57B1I, guarding of the tractor power takeoff shafts. 5, 1920 57 C4I, removal of guards. You're moving the guards to work on equipment. Number 6, 1920 57 A8I, existing guards not adequate to protect that, those moving parts on the machinery. 
Number seven, 1928 C5I, locking out of equipment before it's working on the equipment. Number eight, 1928 A6, farm equipment training, so employees not being trained specifically on the in equipment to operate. Number nine, 1928-57CI, stationary equipment with power takeoff shafts not guarded. And then last, 1904.39A2, a failure to report those non-fatal accidents. So let's get into specifics of each one of these. So first, the 5A1 violations cited. And now we, I'm gonna go through and I wanna be explicit on 12 of the 5A1 violations that we cited. And I'm gonna get in, just go through the list here and then I'm gonna show you some examples of each. So there again, in no specific order as far as how many times they're cited on the 5A1, but these are 12 specific violations that were cited on the 5A1. So the first one is unguarded bench grinders. Number two is electrical deficiencies. So electrical panels, exposed energized parts, circuit breaker panels not labeled, unground electrical equipment unprotected outlets in what locations, and damaged electrical cords. Number three, using corrosive chemicals without access to emergency eyewash stations. Number four, unguarded open-sided floors and platforms. Five, unguarded floor holes. Six, stairways without handrails. Seven, entering confined spaces without removing the hazards. Eight, working at the sheer face of silage piles. Nine, improper use of ladders. 10, fixed ladders without safety cages. 11, skid steer operators not trained. And 12, unguarded table subs. So, so here's an example of the 5A1 for the brace of wheels, the work rests and tongue guards, not adjusted correctly. So you can see on the illustration on your left, if you're using a bench grinder, that work rest has to be adjusted within one eighth inch of the periphery of the wheel. And then the tongue guard at the top, there again, that, if that wheel starts coming apart, that tongue guard will block that wheel from part, particles and parts from striking you. And that uh, tongue guard has to be adjusted with one eighth quarter inch of the wheel. And on the bottom left, it shows you what's called a, a gap gauge there, which you can purchase. And there's a cutouts there with the quarter inch and the eighth inch, so you can make those adjustments to your bench wheels. Second 5A1 illustration here, this is showing electrical panel. There again, showing you on the left-hand side, looking at opening up this panel and the directory is all washed out. So we have no idea what, con what the circuit breakers are controlling. There again, we wanna know if we have an emergency here and we need to open up the panel and shut off the specific circuit breaker that controls a piece of machinery. We wanna shut that off. And then looking to the right side, where now we have circuit breakers that are missing, or I've seen here where I've seen them take pieces of cardboard and put a skull and crossbone over it and say danger, it's not acceptable, or a piece of duct tape over the opening, it's not acceptable. So the concern here is employee reaches in here to flip a circuit breaker off, now their finger slips, now they just go into that opening there and they just make contact with the energized bus bar. All of these openings have to be safeguarded. So you should be putting a, putting a circuit breaker back in this opening or putting a proved blank back in that opening to safeguard those exposed energized parts. Next, showing you a variety of electrical exposed energized parts. So the top left there showing you covers missing in the middle there showing you a junction box with a knockout missing and a cover plate missing on the top right showing you electrical cord with frayed cord and the ground pin removed bottom left showing you again uh, access to electrical panel with the cover off and then the bottom right showing you utilizing plug strips there again you want to make sure the plug strips are rated for the equipment that you're using so many times Employers, employees will use uh, portable heaters or machineries that draw a lot of amperage and they plug in these plug strips. These plug strips get hot and they melt down. Plug strips are great for low voltage equipment like a computer, a printer, uh, chargers for your drills, things that are low voltage, low, low draw of amperage. Moving on, another 5A1, open-sided floors and platforms. There again, anytime I go up onto an 
elevated surface and I can fall more than four feet, I need some means of fall protection. So a typical means of fall protection you're utilizing is a guardrail system. There again, a guardrail system consists of a top rail, mid rail, and post. There again, that top rail should be 42 inches plus or minus three. The mid rail half of that would be 21 inches. And then if you're gonna lay any material on that elevated surface where you could kick off and strike someone down below, you should be installing a standard tow board, which is like a two by four um, erected on its end, on its on side, excuse me. So maintain it three and a half inches high. Also, when you're controlling those falling hazards, so if you're up on a tank, tower, and machinery and other elevated surface, it's best to engineer it out in the first place so you don't have to go up there. But if you do have to go up there, typically you'll install guardrails. And then as a last resort, you could utilize a personal fall rest system. But typically on a surface, an elevated surface where you're over four feet, you'd be installing a, a guardrail system. Also, we found during our inspections of our farms, we had some unguarded floor holes. They're again showing you some illustrations of that where we had grading that didn't adequately protect falling through a floor hole opening, or we saw some instances where employers had just put some boards across some floor openings. There again, all floor openings have to be guarded. Continue on to other 5A1, we had both stairways without handrails. There again, every flight of stairs have a four more riser shall be equipped with standard stair railings or standard handrails. Again, showing you some illustration here in these photos here. Again, four more risers, I gotta have that railing or standard handrails. Also, we cite under 5A1, confined spaces. There again, we have employees who are entering into grain storage bins, silos, hoppers, manure storage vessels, milk vessels, and some of the below grade uh, manure collection systems. There again, these are confined spaces. You need to evaluate these spaces. You need to protect employees, test the air, and protect employees from going into these spaces. So I have that guidance document there, which is an anti safety requirements for confined spaces. You could also, as a best practice, you could use our general understander, which is 1910-146, to assist you in developing a confined space program, identify your spaces, make sure you put up some signage to prohibit unauthorized entry, develop a written program, and establish your entry procedures. Again, so recommend you follow the 1910-146. Also, we cited on 5 and 1, we cited um, hazards relating to horizontal bunker silos. There again, with your horizontal bunker silos, we have the potential for engulfment or strike by hazards. When our employees are performing facing activities, when removing silage from the ground level, there again, serious or fatal fall hazards may exist. Also, when the employees climb up on top of the silage to place or remove the protective plastic covering and anchorage system. So this next slide here is showing you, uh, there again, we got some on the top right there showing you employees in the bucket of a front end loader, not a very safe operation there. Or the bottom right, we got employees putting the tarps over top of the silage there and standing at the edge and exposing themselves to a fall hazard of, of over four feet. Or this next slide here showing you the employees either placing the plastic down or removing the plastic and removing the tires, putting themselves very close to the edge. So definitely here looking for it to utilize a tool or pole or train your employees to, to get back from that edge, making them aware of those hazards, train the employees of these hazards and how to protect themselves. Continuing, continuing on, ladders. So we had some improper use of ladders there again, showing you photographs here. There again, you should not allow your employees to stand on the top step of the step ladder. You should not allow to use your employees to utilize the first step down from the top or even to utilize a portable step ladder in a closed position. You need to train your employees on proper use of portable ladders. Also with fixed ladders without cages. There again, with uh, fixed ladders, that are over 20 feet in height, 
need to have cages installed on them and maintain those cages. And then if you have your uh, fixed ladders on your external silos, uh, those ladder cages shall begin not less than seven feet and not more than eight feet above the silo foundation or grade level. Again, a 5A1, as I stated before, a 5A1, we're citing a consensus standard. So in this case, we'd be citing consensus standard being an ANSI standard, which is for ladder cages, walkways, and stairs. Next, we're showing here is skid steer. Again, utilizing a skid steer, we do not have a agricultural standard for skid steers. Again, we found out there in doing our inspections, we had employees operating these skid steers that were not properly trained and not maintaining and utilizing the skid steers in accordance with the manufacturer's instructions. Again, we found that uh, some bypassings of the safety switches on these skid steers. Okay, again, some of these are also stayed there with a failure to use the appropriate lift arm support device and servicing or maintaining the skid steers. Next, uh, we also found a table saw with the guards not in place. There again, the top left there, we're showing you a table saw with no guards. And then you look at the photo on the bottom right, that's showing you a table guard with the hood over it. It shows you the kickback dogs and the spreader bar. These are things we're looking for when you're utilizing the table saw to rip that wood. So that was number one of the top 10. Those were all 5A1 violations that were cited during the Dairy Farm Operations Local Emphasis Program. Again, 75% of the violations cited during the Local Emphasis Program, 75% of those violations that we found were 5A1s. So this is number two. Number two is 1910-1200, Hazard Communication Program. There again, looking for you come to your establishment, looking to, that you have a hazard communication program. Looking if you've gone through, you've identified the chemicals that your employees are using, looking that you've gone to your supplier and got copies of the safety data sheets for those chemicals that employees are using, and looking for you to train your employees on what the hazards are of those chemicals and how to protect themselves from those chemicals. Again, anytime we come to your establishment, we're looking for your containers, specifically your containers, and even your secondary containers. We're looking to ensure that they are labeled. And two things that we look for, we wanna ensure that you tell us what it is in the container and what the hazard is. So typically if I came to your farm and I saw you using some fuels to refuel your equipment, probably you're gonna have three different containers. You're probably gonna have a red container, a yellow container, and a blue container. And you all know, I'm sure that you know that the red container contains gas, the blue container contains kerosene, and the yellow container contains diesel fuel. And you all know that. But to comply with the OSHA standards, you have to tell me what's in the container. So for example, the, the red container is the gasoline, and then you gotta tell me what the hazard is. And you gotta put the word flammable on that container. Or you can be aligned with the global harmonized system and you could put a pictogram on there, a picture of a flame. Either or is fine, but you gotta tell me what it is and what the hazard is. And like this illustration here, so this is showing me a 55 gallon drum of dew light, so it tells me what it is, and then it tells me what the hazard is, it's a corrosive. But as soon as I see the word corrosive, I'm looking for an eyewash station. I'm looking for an eyewash station, and hopefully I'm not gonna see this. Because if I see this, I'm gonna ask you, what are the emergency procedure for a corrosive? And if you, and I'm gonna ask you for the safety data sheet, and that safety data sheet is gonna tell me I need to flush my eyes for 15 minutes. And these two little bottles are not gonna cut it. So uh, probably what I'm gonna look to see and what I wanna see, so I'm either gonna see a plumb unit, like he's shown here on the left in the middle, or if you don't have a plumb unit, you're gonna have a self-contained unit, like the illustration and photograph on the right, this unit contains 15 minutes of water. So that's what we're looking for. And if you don't have that, we're gonna cite a 5A1. There again, we're gonna cite the 5A1, the general duty clause, and then we're gonna reference the consensus standard for utilizing a corrosive and not having an emergency eye wash station. 
Number three, 1928 C2I, guarding of power transmission equipment. There again, looking you, showing us there, we have a motor, motor drives a belt, and then that belt drives that implement, piece of equipment, whatever that may be. So looking for that guarding of that ingoing nip point. So ingoing nip point between that belt and that pulley, or on the right side there, showing you a chain and sprocket, guarding that ingoing nip point. It needs to be fully guarded so employees can't get in, hand in there, or finger in there, and sustain this amputation. Guarding of the power transmission. Number four, 1920 57 B1I, guarding the po power takeoffs. Again, guarding the power takeoff, make sure we had that shield, shield, master shield, nipple machine shield, and drive shield to protect that so we don't get caught in that power takeoff. And also be aware, New York's Center for Architectural Medicine and Health, they have developed a PTO retrofit program to replace damaged or missing PTO shields. Number five, 1920 57 C4I, removal of guarding to work on equipment. Again, if you need to work on a piece of equipment, okay, you need to shut that down. You need, you're going to remove that. You got to shut it down. You got to protect. It. You can't employees working on a piece of equipment while it's running. Number six, inadequate guarding of equipment. So the one on the left there is showing where they put a nice wire mesh there, but now there's an opening that they can reach into the, to the machinery, the point of operation, or on the top right, showing you the a belt and pulley there. They put a nice guard over the top, but they didn't guard the bottom side of it. I could reach in, I could still make contact with the belt and pulley, the ingoing nip points. Number seven, 1928 57 C5IA, hazardous energy control while performing servicing and maintenance on equipment. We need to follow the manufacturer instructions. We need to shut these pieces of equipment down before you work on them because we get to get crushed by, struck by, caught in between, entanglement, amputation hazards. So working on a piece of equipment, you need to shut it down. There again, we recommend 1910-147, a lockout tag control of hazard energy, which is a best practice. So develop a lockout tagout procedure. So if you're gonna work on a piece of equipment, what are we gonna to do to shut it down? We have a procedure to protect our employees by working on these piece of equipment. You need to shut it down. Number eight. 1928.57A6, training. We need to train our employees. So employees are going to operate this various equipment on the farm. We need to have operators instructions. And so we need to train them when they initially we have our initial assignment to the employee before they start using a piece of equipment. And then we need to train them at least annually. So train them on the safe operations and servicing of the equipment. Number nine. So we talked about PTO before on our farm equipment. Now we're talking about our stationary equipment. So here's an illustration here. So it's showing you on the bottom right where I've got a pump unit there for our underground manure uh, system. And then we bring in, in this case, on this farm, they bring in a tractor to operate that pumping system. So now it becomes a piece of stationary equipment. So number nine, 1920 B1I. And then number 10, number 10, not reporting those non-fatal injuries that are occurring. As I stated before, under 1904.39A2, anytime you have an employee who is hospitalized, anytime an employee sustains an amputation or a loss of eye, you must report it to OSHA within 24 hours. So I want to put out a word for you as far as getting assistance getting another set of eyes out to your farm to assist you. So there again, contact your different groups and associations out there. Contact your insurance companies to assist you, but also be aware if you are a small employer of 250 employees or less, you can contact New York State on-site consultation service. So be aware in New York State, if you are a town, village, city, or state employee, Enforcement of you is covered by New York State Department of Labor, OSHA, which is also called PESH. But be aware, for all private industry, New York State has a 21D on-site consultation program, and they will assist all private employers, like yourselves. 
They will come out to your farm, make a walk around inspection with you, make a written recommendation to you to be in compliance with our standards and no charge to you. So you'll walk around with you, you'll point out things, they'll point out things, as long as you correct those conditions in a timely period, they'll get them corrected, they'll give you a certificate, great job, and they'll move on. And that's no cost to you. Your New York State tax dollars are paying for that service. And then on this slide here is the OSHA consultation program. Their offices located throughout New York State. So if you're in Buffalo and Rochester, you want to call their Buffalo office. If you're in Albany or Utica area, you're going to contact the Albany area. And if you're in Syracuse or Binghamton, you're going to call the Syracuse office. And again, everything I talk to you about today, you can go to our website. Go to our website, take a look at the architecture, agricultural operations, take a lot of good information there as far as posters that you need, a lot of information about fatal facts, accidents that have occurred throughout the nation, uh, definitely a lot of, of publications, and again, a lot of publications, quick cards to assist you in multiple languages. There again, it doesn't matter what language that employee speaks, you must train them, make them aware of what the hazards they're being exposed to and how to protect them from those hazards. And with that, I've completed my presentation. Great, thank you very much, Ron. Um, we do have a few questions that have come in. Um, one was asking for clarification on the temporary labor camp issue. Um, at the very beginning, you mentioned um, more than 10 employees or a temporary labor camp, so if you have a temporary labor camp, but still fewer than 10 employees, are you covered by OSHA? You are covered, yes, you are covered by OSHA, but not under the local emphasis program. So if we come, okay. to your, we come to your site because of the local emphasis program, the only thing we're asking, we're, we're, we're only gonna ask you is based on number of employees. We're gonna ask you if you've had 11 or more employees any one time in the last 12 months. Okay. But if we're um, not, another. Sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. No. So, so again, if we're coming because we had imminent danger, we're coming there because of a fatality, uh, a non-fatal accident, or a referral. We're going to ask you how many employees you've had in with one time in the last twelve months, or we're going to ask you if you've had a temporary labor camp. Okay. Thank you. Uh, another question is, um, I know that you're focused on New York State, but are you aware of, of similar programs such as the Local Emphasis Program in uh, New Jersey or New England? None at this time. Okay. Um, a question came in about material safety data sheets. Do you have to have copies of MSDSs for any applicable chemicals on site or do they need to be, a, or can they be available within a period of time? They, they need to be accessible. So if you are utilizing an online service, that's fine. The concern is if, if you have an employee and now that employee is passed out and now somebody picks up the phone, calls 911, and now that ambulance responds to your location, that paramedic or that EMT is gonna come off that ambulance and they're gonna ask for a copy of that information. So you need a means to be able to download information and print that sheet off. Sheet off. Same way too, okay. with comes on your site we're going to ask you that information so they need to be basically immediately accessible but there again you can utilize an online service as long as you have access to a computer and a printer that's fine okay okay um, and and what about uh, having MSDS is um, in other languages other than English you need if, if it's if it's not in English somebody needs to translate that because you need to make that information available to that employee who does not speak English. Make okay. employee aware of the hazards they're being exposed to and how to protect them from those hazards. So if you have a Spanish employee that speaks only Spanish, then you would need to have MSDS forms for whatever is applicable to them. That is correct. Okay. Um, let's see, I'm just looking at questions that have come in. Um, I don't see any additional questions at this time. So um, I'm going to sign off unless you have any final thoughts, Ron. Again, I want to say spend particular attention to those items I talked about with the reference to the 5A1s. 
75 percent of the violations that we issued were 5a1s and most of those citations had to do electrical deficiencies again oh. electricity is a hazard you can't see but many many people are getting hurt from electrocution okay um, before we go, I'd like to thank NEDPA, the Northeast Dairy Producers Association, for co-sponsoring this webinar. Um, I'd like to thank you very much, Ron, for um, your participation today. <coughs> it's, uh, it's a big help to um, dairy farms and others that are trying to have safe workplaces and comply with the applicable regulations. And um, this, as mentioned previously, this webinar is, is recorded and will be hosted on our uh, website farmcredits.com slash webinars and with that we are adjourned